Good morning. This morning, our Old Testament reading will come from Exodus chapter 12, verses 12 through 20, the Passover. For I, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both men and beasts, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. As a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, on the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses, for if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall hold a holy assembly, and on the seventh day a holy assembly. No work shall be done on those days, but what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared by you. And you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this, this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. In the first month, from the fourteenth day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. For seven days no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a sojourner or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwelling places you shall eat unleavened bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Judy. Our sermon scripture this morning can be found in the Gospel of John, chapter 2. And of course, it is printed in your bulletins and also will be shown on the screen. And in the second chapter of John, we'll be looking at verses 13 through 22. John 2, 13 through 22. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we have so much to be thankful for. And Lord, we thank you for this day that we are able to freely gather and worship you. And Lord, we thank you for your written word and the opportunity we have to read it as well as proclaim it. So Lord, during this time, as we do read it as well as proclaim it, we pray that by you, the power of your Holy Spirit, you would use it to open our hearts, our minds, our ears, as well as our eyes to learn not just for head knowledge, but for heart knowledge, to be transformed more, to be like your Son, our Savior and Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. Jesus cleanses the temple. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, in a temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there, and making a whip of cords. He drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead 
And his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of the Lord. The title of our sermon this morning is Jesus, Meek or Radical? There was once a woman named Emily Post. And she was born sometime in the early 1870s, and she died in 1960. Well, what made her name famous was a book that she wrote titled Etiquette. And this book, which ran through 10 editions at the public house which handled her book, taught people how to get along politely in society. Well, some of what she said was good. I remember back in my 11th grade, a local business, IBM, International Business Machine Corporation, invited a small group of us to visit their Endicott, New York plant. Well, our tour, they took us also to a very fancy restaurant. Well, as we sat down at this restaurant, they had all the tables pre-set up with each place setting, which had many forks, many knives, and many spoons. Well, personally, I had never seen anything quite like this in my entire life. Are all of these for me? Which fork do I use? Which spoon do I use? Which knife do I use first? That was my question. Well, Mrs. Post wrote this. Manners are a sensitive awareness of the feelings of others. If you have that awareness, you have good manners, no matter which fork you use. However, it seemed also that she wrote many other things. She also wrote, to do exactly as your neighbors do is the only sensible rule. Now many others say it this way, when in Rome, do as Romans do. Now I do not know about you, but that does not necessarily seem like very wise advice to me. Nor, in fact, does it sound very Jesus-like. But isn't that the case, that over the years, centuries even, even within the church, the church has given us a picture of Jesus who was quiet and calm and reserved. The Jesus who was so meek and mild that it's very difficult to even imagine with our minds that anyone would get so angry at him that they would want to kill him. But the picture of Jesus as meek and mild is only half of the picture. As we currently read within John's Gospel verses this morning. Here within this passage, we have a picture of Jesus that we do not see very often. It is an angry Jesus. It is a loud Jesus. It is a not so meek and mild Jesus. So let me set up this scene for you. Yes, it's Passover time. That's a holiday. That's a, a holy day celebrated in early spring, reminding the people of God's deliverance from slavery in the land of Egypt and, of course, of God's fierce judgment passing over the homes of God's people that had been marked with the blood of a sacrificial lamb. It's a time of unleavened bread, lamb, as well as herbs. It is a time of sacrificial lambs as well as pilgrimages to the temple of Jerusalem for all to gather and offer prayer. We read in the 14th verse, In the temple, he, Jesus, found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. Now in Matthew's gospel, he says that Jesus entered the temple courts. And I believe that's very important because the word courts means here the outer courtyards of the temple rather than the inner sanctum, so to speak. In fact, and very important for our understanding of this gospel story, the temple courtrooms which he had entered was the place reserved for all of the Gentiles to gather to worship. But we read that in this place of the Gentiles, that is the, the non-Jews who nevertheless 
wanted also to worship God, but had not gone through the ritual of becoming Jews, well, this space was reserved for them to worship. And now it seems to be a, been taken up with a whole variety of stalls selling all sorts of commodities, right? Especially related to this Passover ritual of sacrifice and those changing money. Indeed, pilgrims, Jews and non-Jews alike, many of which came from foreign lands far, far away, and they needed to exchange their, their coin, their currency, into temple currency. After all, on their coins, if they lived outside of the Roman Empire was one thing, but if they lived within the Roman Empire, their currency bore the image of Caesar. And it would be next to blasphemous for them to offer these with Caesar's picture on it to God. And in addition to changing their money, they would need to also buy and purchase animals for them to sacrifice. Well, I guess that on the face value that none of this was bad within itself. To an extent, the traders were providing an essential service to all of those whom desired to make themselves right before God. But on the other hand, these traders were so many, and because of the massive amount of them, they took up so much space that they were almost making it impossible for the Gentiles to have enough room for them to also worship God. What had once begun with the intention of providing a surface service had now, in fact, become a disservice. And Jesus, as he arrived, he sees this. But it is more important than evident that the sight that greets Jesus there this very day, as he and his disciples arrive to prepare to observe Passover, angers him greatly. Now there probably is much more to this story as well. It is probable that the money changers were including a very hefty, outrageous even, exchange rate for their services of exchanging this Roman currency. And it all seems as if these traders may be making very large profits from the religious needs of all of the faithful people that had gathered there. Continuing, beginning with verse 15, and making a whip of cords, Jesus drove them out of the temple with the sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. So in his righteous anger, Jesus is acting against the double injustice that is first, preventing the non-Jewish people from worshiping God because all the room had been consumed by these traitors. And secondly, cheating these worshipers by charging a very unfair exchange rate for their currency. In his words, as well as within his actions, yes, Jesus is angry. Yes, Jesus is rebelling against unjust practices that are preventing people being able to get close to God through worship. Is it the case then that God calls us also to be rebels? That God calls us to do the opposite of when in Rome do as the Romans do? I like the story of a, a man walking into a local gift store that had also religious items for sale. Well, near the cash register, there was a display of baseball caps bearing the logo WWJD. Now he's very puzzled over what these letters could possibly mean, so he asked the person behind the counter. She replied that these letters on this logo stood for what would Jesus do and was meant to inspire people not to make rash decisions, but rather to imagine and emulate what Jesus would do if he found himself within that particular perplexing situation. Well, this man, he thought there for a moment, and then he replied, well, I'm sure that Jesus wouldn't pay $30 for these hats. <laughs> so there's the question, one that I believe that is better asked. What would Jesus tell us to do? Well, our gospel verses for this morning 
shows us that sometimes, yes, Jesus went against the grain. Sometimes Jesus stood up and Jesus spoke out against the unfair practices as well as the attitudes of his day. Yes, sometimes Jesus was a rebel. Now perhaps we don't hear this idea very often or we don't hear it often enough. The word rebel usually carries negative connotations with it, doesn't it? Rebelling against society. Rebelling against what our schools are teaching. Rebelling against certain television programs or movies. Rebelling against certain businesses. And it is usually, perhaps, to lump all of these things together and to say that, yes, rebelling is generally bad. Well, let's think about that for a moment this morning. Is it possible for us to be a rebel and also to be a Christian? That's our question for this morning. And it seems that the answer is yes. The Bible tells us that as believers in Jesus, we are to be conformed to his likeness. We're told in Romans chapter 8, For those he, God, foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to be the image of his Son. The Bible also tells us that we are to put on the mind of Christ. Every moment of every day, we should strive to behave as Jesus would behave if he were also facing those same situations that we find ourselves in that we're facing. Therefore, what daily choices should we make in order for us to be more like Jesus? Well, it seems that we can, in fact, we should follow Jesus' examples. Remember, what would Jesus tell us to do? Rebel against unfair aspects of society and the world affairs and not rebel against God. Just look at the prophets of old as they spoke out, even at great personal risk of their life against all the injustices in their lives as well as in their times. Look at Jesus in a temple on this particular day in our scripture. He was considered to be rebelling. He was considered to be acting and speaking out against the unfair, the unjust practices associated with the religion at his time. Practices that prevented so many people from drawing close to God in worship and observing their religious duty and their religious practices of that day. But Jesus, in this passage, he was not rebelling against God. Jesus wasn't saying that the whole religious system was wrong and had to be thrown out. No. He was saying that, yes, there were flaws, and yes, there were problems in how people were providing services associated with it. So sometimes, as believers, as followers of Jesus, we are called to rebel. And I do not mean rebel against God. I mean rebel against injustice. Rebel against what is wrong. Rebel against what is ungodly. Things that Jesus would have also rebelled against. Sometimes God calls us to rebel against the way that everyone else, it sometimes seems, has got so used to doing or not doing things. Sometimes we as Christians are called to rebel against what others sometimes, even the majority, may believe that is even right. So let's not do something just because it seems that everybody else is doing it. Let's not passively, when in Rome, do as Romans do. If we truly believe that there is a better way, a more just and fair way, if there is a way, more Christ-like way to do it. Again, what would Jesus tell us to do? So yes, there will be times when what we feel God is leading us to do will be different from what others around us are advocating as well as even doing. And that's okay. And at that moment, yes, it may 
be very scary when we discern God's calling for us to rebel, to go against the flow, so to speak. But it's when God is calling us to do and to be. And at those times, we need to do and we need to be what God wants us to do and what God wants us to be. Now, it might look like rebellion to others, especially to those who want to keep things just the way they are. And maybe it is rebellion, but it is a good rebellion. It is obedience to God's will, and it is Christ-like. It's like John the Baptist or like Elijah or many of the other prophets of God whom we have throughout Scripture. It's like all the disciples who would not tow the party line, so to speak. It's being a rebel with a cause, God's holy cause. And when you think about it, even our Heavenly Father's radical plan for the salvation of His children, the good news message that mankind can be saved from the penalty of their sin and receive eternal life in heaven with God through the death, burial, and resurrection of His only begotten Son, our Savior and Lord, Jesus the Christ. And if you possibly may be hearing this for the very first time today, or even the seventh time, or the 7.3 time you've heard that, it doesn't matter. This good news, this gospel of Jesus Christ, is the best news that anyone will ever hear. And also, what a person does with this news will also determine where he or she spends eternity. Now in closing... J.B. Phillips wrote a book titled, Your God is Too Small. And in it, he comments on a line of a verse of a Christmas carol titled, Once in Royal David City. And the line that he commented on says this, Christian children all must be mild, obedient, good as he. And this is what he wrote. This word mild is apparently deliberately used to describe Jesus, a man who did not hesitate to challenge and expose the hypocrisies of the religious people of his day, a man who was regarded by the authorities as a public danger, a man who could be moved to violent anger by shameless exploitation or smug complacency, a man of such courage that he deliberately walked to what he knew would mean death despite the earnest pleas of well-meaning friends. Mild? What a word to use, J.B. Phillips exclaims. Jesus Christ might be called meek, he says, in the sense of being utterly devoted to what he considered right, whatever the personal cost. But mild? Never. So people of God, we don't always have to be mild. We don't always have to to fit in. We don't always have to do what our neighbors do, as Emily Post suggests. As long as it is God that is leading us, we need to do whatever we have to do to follow his will. Yes, we can rebellious as long as the end result is to become more Christ-like in order to co-create with God the kingdom of all justice, peace, and joy in all of its fullness wants for us here upon the face of this earth. All thanks, glory, and honor be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus' example of how that we should be, always willing to be the Christians you want us to be, and not just followers of this world trying to fit in, but followers of Jesus. And Lord, if there's anyone that has heard this message of the good news of the gospel of your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, for the first time, the seventh time, the hundredth time, and you put upon them by the power of your Holy Spirit that you want them to become part of your kingdom, that this day would be that day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.